Uh, let's start with uh, the corporate bond market because I think it, it's the best example of how liquidity has changed. If you look at bid-ask spreads, they're not wider. But if you look at um, the inventories that are being kept by the banks on their own balance sheets, they're a lot smaller. So if you go to a bank now, um, you're going to have to wait to execute a large trade, whether it's a buy or a sell. If it's a buy, they're not going to have it in stock. If it's a sell, um, they're as likely as not to say, well, hang on, I'll try to find a buyer for your position and I'll get back to you. They won't offer you a price. They'll wait for a buyer. They'll find out uh, the price at which the buyer might be willing to absorb it. They'll take uh, what's called a riskless principal trade or sometimes an agency-based trade by which they avoid ever carrying that position on their balance sheet for more than a, a moment, or maybe not at all. So they're not giving up much balance sheet space uh, because the regulations, both capital requirements and their funding costs coming from failure resolution requirements, um, make it prohibitively expensive for them to expand their balance sheet to accommodate your trade. So for large trades, the biggest cost is delay. Also for less actively traded bonds, liquidity provision is significantly less. Uh, that's being shown in some research that's being done here by one of my students, Yu An. And I think you're going to see more and more around this issue of um, changing structure of liquidity provision. It's still the case that only about 15% of corporate bonds are traded electronically. So the vast majority of those trades, you still have to call a dealer, still have to get a bilateral uh, quotes. And uh, even 10 years after the crisis, it's still the case that um, you can't create competition very easily for, uh, for your trades. And it's exactly when space on bank balance sheets is so expensive that we should be doing more to develop all-to-all -all trade platforms, or at least more competitive trade platforms that allow us to bypass the bank balance sheets and get uh, liquidity provision in, in other ways. I think the corporate bond market is, is um, under-examined under in terms of its, um, um, the inefficiencies that are still there. Uh, I think it's market structure, it's not technology. And I wouldn't suggest you want all to all for everything. There's always going to be customized um, positions or exotics or very rarely traded instruments where an all to all platform may not make sense. Uh, but uh, one of the reasons we don't see more all to all trading is that the dealers don't want it. Right now, they're getting almost all almost 100% of the market share in terms of intermediation and the bid offer spreads, at least on, on, uh, on many financial instruments, are bigger than they would be in an all-to-all -all setting. So the dealers don't have an incentive uh, to assist the development of that market. In fact, I was an expert on a litigation a couple of years ago in which the dealers were alleged to have colluded in order to prevent the introduction of all-to-all -all trade in the credit default swap market. And uh, uh, that didn't go to court. They settled out of court for over $1.8 billion in uh, early 2017. And uh, I, I wouldn't um, I'd be surprised if that kind of behavior, assuming it was true in the CDS market, also applies in, in other uh, fixed income markets. Uh, there are there are some technology issues, but I think they can be overcome. There's been, they're being discussed in in many in a number of markets. We do see all to all within the interdealer markets uh, in fixed income, but we have this two tiered structure in which the dealers themselves have central limit order book markets, and the buy side still uh, do all their trades with dealers rather than each other. We are also seeing some inroads into the interdealer trade platforms of principal trading firms or high-frequency trading firms that are picking up some of the market share there.
Well, in the securities transformation, uh, liquidity transformation markets like repo, uh, there's been a lot of concern by regulators. And as you know, the tri-party repo market has been dramatically improved in terms of the amount of weak collateral that's um, that's going through the tri-party market has been reduced a lot. The amount of intraday credit provision by the agent clearing banks uh, has been reduced a lot. Uh, so that market is safer now than it was before. More could be done. Um, there's been a lot of focus on ETFs particularly with respect to whether they can handle uh, uh, waves of redemptions that uh, investors generate, particularly when they're chasing returns or frightened by um, uh, declining prices. Uh, regulators have reacted, at least in terms of the studies that they've that they've done, but I don't see much in terms of new regulation. I'm not as worried, actually, about ETFs as I am about mutual funds. Uh, because ETFs, as you know, have a built-in uh, safety valve, which is you don't have to force the fund provider to liquidate the underlying assets. You can get liquidity in the market for the ETF itself, uh, as opposed to a mutual fund in which at the end of each day, if there's a net redemption, basically assets need to be liquidated. The Securities and Exchange Commission has been watching um, the cash buffers of the mutual funds quite carefully and is, have encouraged them to set aside more cash. I think 5 to 7 percent is, is kind of typical and it probably should be sensitive to the liquidity of the underlying assets. There's also been some discussion of swing pricing, uh, which would effectively penalize the uh, uh, investors in mutual funds that want to redeem rapidly uh, in a when there's a uh, a rush for the exits. Uh, well, that's a great question. Counter cyclical capital buffers have been around for a while. Spain introduced them even before the crisis, and they may have helped a bit in Spain uh, uh, to help them weather the storm of. Uh, um, the real estate market in Spain, which caused the banks a lot of losses there. They have been explored uh, post-crisis through the Basel process, and there's a standing recommendation that each jurisdiction consider them carefully. Uh, but I haven't seen much action in terms of um, the actual implementation of significant countercyclical capital buffers. They're on the books. It's possible to use them uh, in, ter in terms of regulation, but they haven't been used heavily by regulators. Um, I believe Eric Rosengren recently suggested uh, that this might be a time to do that. As you know, uh, he is the president of the Boston Fed and one of the leading, one of the thought leaders at the Fed on these kinds of issues. Um, uh, Countercyclical capital buffers. It, he's right. It would, this would be a good time to do that because uh, the economy is perking along quite well. Capital buffers are uh, certainly not under stress. It's it's exactly when that's the case that you want to load up on capital, so as to give you more space uh, to use that capital in a stressed market. So I'm a fan, um, but. Um, it remains to be seen how much they're actually going to get used. Uh, if you think about it the following way, um, when would you rather load capital? Uh, when capital is relatively cheap because you're in a boom? Or when capital is extremely expensive because you're in a stress period? Uh, bank shareholders det detest the idea that when a bank's actually running against uh, its solvency, required solvency levels, that it's forced to raise capital because that's exactly when the discounts on new issues are quite severe. And you, you often see discounts of 50 or 
even higher percentage, like Unicredit did one a couple of years ago in which they took a terrible beating. Uh, much cheaper it would be to raise capital when you don't really need to raise it so that you have excess around. But it's, it's generally in the interest of shareholders to run on thin capital anyway uh, because they have that option to keep the upside and avoid the downside. And it's up to regulators to impose those regulations on them to protect the, the broader economy. It's a natural uh, separation of responsibilities. The shareholders are looking after their returns and the regulators are looking after the rest of us. As the supplementary leverage ratio or SLR is an alternative way of measuring the amount of capital that a bank has relative to its assets. The traditional way to do it is called risk-based capital requirement, uh, which adjusts the assets for their risk and requires capital based on the risk-adjusted uh, amount of assets, whereas the supplementary leverage ratio doesn't adjust for risk. It just adds up all the assets and uh, requires the bank to hold a given fraction of those ass unadjusted assets. So in the United States, the largest uh, banks are subject to a 6% supplementary leverage ratio under the Fed's interpretation of this uh, requirement, which means for every $100 of assets on its balance sheet, regardless of the risk, it needs to have $6 of capital. That would be the same whether it was uh, risky real estate loans or treasury securities or central bank deposits. Um, the implication is that banks are much less interested now in intermediating safe assets as they were before, uh, because they have to have the same amount of capital for safe assets as risky assets, and the, the profits associated with intermediating safe assets for their shareholders are much smaller. So what we're seeing in practice is a shift away from activities like um, government securities repurchase agreements, or repo, as an intermediation business because it uses up a lot of balance sheet with respect to the sub supplementary leverage ratio. And uh, there's not enough juice in it uh, in terms of shareholder returns. Okay, so people have asked me, uh, well, if you're not a fan of the supplementary leverage ratio, how do you propose to um, get the right amount of capital into banks. And a uh, common concern is that uh, the risk-based risk capital requirements are mismeasured because banks use internal models to measure their risk and uh, the banks have an incentive to understate their risks for that reason. The regulators need to react by uh, being more conservative with respect to the kinds of internal modeling that they allow the banks to use. The regulators them, themselves are a bit at fault because they don't assign any risk weights to government securities. Uh, governments are usually easy on themselves and they're loath to criticize each other for the quality of their government securities. So uh, most government securities don't require any capital. So whether it's the banks understating their risks or the regulators not assigning risk weights to government securities, the risk weighted requirements also have a problem. The supplementary leverage ratio was brought in as uh, a backstop, just in case the risk weights didn't work. But if you look at the numbers, and I have, it's the supplementary leverage ratio that's the binding constraint. And the risk weighted requirements are just a backstop, the way things are now. We need to flip that around. Uh, so either you need to add, increase the risk weighted requirements or reduce the supplementary leverage ratio. The problem with the latter is that bank capital goes down. And in my view, it's, it's not too high. One could um, adjust the supplementary leverage ratio and, uh, selectively so that it doesn't lean so hard on the safest assets, like Treasury repo. And in the last uh, report from the Department of Treasury, um, the so-called executive orders report on reforming the financial uh, regulations, they did hint that they may do this and so have some uh, leaders at the Fed suggest 
that they need to look further into whether the supplementary leverage ratio is working properly. So I do expect some, some adjustments in that area. Another thing you could do if you're really convinced that the supplementary leverage ratio is the right way to go is to calculate how much capital there should be in the entire banking system based on the supplementary leverage ratio, but don't apply it to each individual bank. Just increase the risk-weighted requirements until you get that amount of capital into the banking system uh, so that each bank will then adjust its market making and other activities according to the risk-weighted requirements, but that you have enough capital in the system according to the supplementary leverage ratio. And I've made that suggestion in my Buffy lecture to the Banca of Italy uh, as a as another way to get at this problem. I agree with that. There's, there's always going to be some give and take, and these capital regulations are are always uh, crude um, approaches to making the bank safer. So when you're uncertain about uh, whether these requirements are working well, the natural reaction should be to raise overall capital levels in the banking system to guard against any problems. The banks don't like that because their shareholders lose money when you raise capital. It, it, tends, to, uh, it tends to increase the value of the bank's debt and therefore it has to reduce the value of the bank's equity. It's called debt overhang. Uh, but again, this is um, an issue of uh, safety and soundness of the financial system. The regulators shouldn't be shy. I noticed that the pendulum has been swinging back towards lighter capital requirements uh, in the latest rounds of discussion, both in Europe and the United States, and I think that's a mistake. I think capital levels are, are not too low, pardon me, are not too high. Okay, so surprisingly, I don't think that's a capital regulation. I think it's the new failure resolution requirements, uh, which force creditors to bear losses in the event of a bank's insolvency by being bailed in. The creditors know that they have a big bullseye on their back now. If a bank starts to get uh, close to the point at which regulators uh, would convert the debt into equity and cause the creditors to lose money. And uh, they charge up for it. The credit yield spreads on bank debt are much, much higher than they were before the crisis, despite the fact the banks are a lot safer. Those increased funding costs um, are being borne most heavily on fixed income market liquidity. Uh, so that if a bank uh, wants to make markets in bonds, it needs uh, to raise a lot of debt capital to fund the inventories. Debt capital is a lot more expensive now because of the failure resolution requirements. So the banks just don't have as much bond inventory and they're not as accommodating uh, to buy side firms that want to sell a lot of bonds on short notice. That's reduced market liquidity in the fixed income area quite a lot. I was actually surprised when I uh, discovered that it wasn't capital requirements, it was funding costs that are the biggest costs uh, to market liquidity in areas like the bond market. At the end of 2021, the Financial Conduct Authority will no longer regulate LIBOR and won't expect the banks to necessarily report uh, into the poll that produces LIBOR every day. And the banks don't want to do that. Uh, it just raises uh, litigation risks and reputational risks for them uh, because of the past manipulations of LIBOR. And LIBOR itself is not really a reliable benchmark because the transactions that underlie it, meaning one month, three month, or six month unsecured term borrowing by large banks, those transactions are much, much thinner now than they were before. So the rate's just not that reliable as a benchmark. Most of the numbers being reported are just opinions, which is what got us into trouble in the first place. At the same time, the head of the uh, European regulator, ESMA, Stephen Mayor, has announced that in 2020, a year earlier, uh, Euribor and Ionia will no longer be available. 
uh, for similar concerns. The banks in Europe are also disappearing from those holes, and there's worries about the robustness of those two European benchmarks. Between them, those two benchmarks, Ionia and LIBOR, account for three to four hundred trillion dollars of swaps, and the market is concerned for obvious reasons. What are we going to do? Going forward, each of the currency zones, except Europe so far, have proposed alternative benchmarks. In the United States, the benchmark is the overnight repo rate, uh, which will be called the Secured Overnight Financing Rate, or SOFR. And so, perhaps in five years, almost all of our rates markets, which are floating rate, whether swaps or floating rate notes, corporate loans, even credit cards and mortgage loans linked to currently linked to LIBOR, those will be based on SOFR. And there's a transition project that's underway to get people to start using these new rates. In fact, next week the Fed is going to publish SOFR for the first time. Uh, one of the concerns I have is that these hundreds of trillions of legacy LIBOR and URIBOR contracts span well beyond the end of the, or at least the suggested end of these, of these new benchmarks. Uh, so what are we going to do with these legacy contracts? Once URIBOR and LIBOR are not available, how will they settle? Uh, they can't. If the, if the benchmarks are gone, they need to settle based on the new benchmarks. So you're going to need to talk to, let's say, your counterparty on a swap and negotiate, perhaps, what they would accept in view of getting LIBOR and only getting SOFR, a much smaller rate, what they would accept in compensation for that change. And that's not an easy conversation because there's no liquid markets currently for SOFR and there may not be in time uh, to conduct these negotiations. Perhaps the industry groups like ISDA will step in and find a protocol for making those compensatory contract adjustments. Uh, but there's little of that even ISDA could do if, the, if there's no liquid market for SOFR-based products going out to term structure to, say, 10 years. An alternative that I've been working on is a series of periodic auctions uh, that in which buyers and sellers will come into the market providing bids and offers to convert their legacy contracts to the new rates. And uh, those auctions will settle at a market clearing rate, which could be used as the benchmark for converting other contracts that don't participate in the auctions. And I've been discussing this proposal with regulators and banks and buy-side firms and central counterparties who would probably have to conduct the auctions uh, to gauge uh, the usefulness of the approach and to help me understand uh, some of the design problems that are involved. There's also a PhD student here at Stanford named Anthony Jung, who's um, uh, writing a research paper on how to do that, on how to design the, uh, the auction so that it'll be appealing to those that want to bid uh, and so that the prices that come out of those auctions will be reliable uh, for a protocol-based conversion for those that don't want to bid in the auction. So that's um, um, a project that, that is the whole transition, is a project that uh, needs more attention. A lot of people are still writing 10-year LIBOR contracts without thinking about the fact that LIBOR may not be here three years from now. There are industry groups. In the United States, the group is called the Alternative Reference Rate Committee uh, that are leading uh, this transition. Uh, but the financial industry, I think, needs to come to grips with the fact that this needs to be done before it becomes an emergency. Post-crisis, as you know, it's been 10 years. We've got a lot of legislation, the dominant G20 movement to get uh, mainly the banks uh, re-regulated uh, has many moving parts. The biggest and most successful parts, I would say, are in three areas. One is the capital requirements, which didn't require legislation anyway. 
uh, and they've significantly improved the capital uh, levels of the banks uh, to the point that I think they're much less likely to fail. Uh, the second area is covered in legislation under Dodd-Frank and in MIFID, that is the Markets and Financial Institutions Directives in Europe, uh, deals with uh, derivatives markets and uh, imposes much tighter requirements on central counterparties, trade repositories, and trading methods, and margin requirements. And I think, uh, for example, Title VII of Dodd-Frank, dealing with derivatives, is generally agreed to be the most successful part of Dodd-Frank. Uh, and it's been quite a positive force for financial stability. And uh, something that's not often mentioned, which I, I think is quite important, is the effect that it's also had on improved competitiveness uh, in the derivatives markets, where you don't necessarily now have to go through a dealer bilaterally. Uh, you can request quotes from multiple dealers on a platform and get more competition for your trade request. The third area, which I think has been influential beyond um, the common discussion, is failure resolution. Uh, and as you know, these are rules that force the large banks uh, to put themselves into a condition that makes it possible for them to be re recapitalized over a weekend. Now, do I think that it's going to work? Well, I'm not so confident. But the fact that the, um, the regulations exist forces the banks to have a capital structure which is more suitable uh, for failure resolution and more importantly forces creditors to internalize uh, the costs that they might uh, experience if a bank gets near insolvency. And you see that in dramatically higher credit spreads and uh, wholesale unsecured funding for banks. Why is that important? Well, pre-crisis banks would expand their balance sheets almost without hesitation to get a few basis points. And they could do that with unsecured funding that was very cheap because wholesale creditors knew that the banks probably wouldn't be allowed to fail. Now, despite much higher capital levels, the credit spreads on the banks have not gone down. They've gone up a lot. And that causes banks to think very carefully about what they want to load onto their balance sheets. The funding costs are quite significant. Uh, and that has both positive and negative effects. The positive effect is that the banks are much less likely to load up on risk and be a menace to the economy. The negative effect is if you need immediacy as a buy side firm, uh, banks are not going to provide it in any way that, you know, any, anything close to the extent that they did before the crisis. So you have to find other ways to execute your trade, or you just have to be more patient if you have a large trade you want to execute. 